hey now it's a podcast oh, no. get your book on <laughs> read stuff um hey welcome to literary af my name is sheldon i'm danny uh have we done that intro before no we have not oh, i would have remembered thank for goodness sure. <laughs> so i feel like that's been in my head since we started doing the uh song parody intros yeah uh you just it, ready for it? It'll probably come up again it, next week. Yeah, probably. Um, well, anyway, this is Literary AF. It's a podcast where we read books. <laughs> and we talk... Actually, it's a podcast where we talk about books that we previously <laughs> read. Um, I think if we just read books on the podcast, it'd be an audio book, technically. It, yeah, or just silence. <laughs> yeah, just <laughs> quietly reading. <laughs> We're just listening to an audio book that's it's, getting recorded. It's book reading ASMR. Annoyed sighs and page <laughs> flippings. Yep, yep, yep. Um, no, we're, so the book we're talking about today is The Talented Mr. Ripley by Patricia Highsmith. Okay. Um, this book is a book I had to read in my first year of university. Okay. Uh, in an English class. It is... Okay, so the... It takes place in the 1950s. Okay. Um, the... Copyright in the front cover of the book says 1955, so I'm guessing that's the first year it was initially released. Right. But it does say 1983 shortly after. So um, somewhere between 55 and 83, this book came out. <laughs> I always mean to, like, look these things up. Because, mm-hmm. like, you know, some of my books are from, like... Old? Yeah, they're from, like, the 1700s or whatever. And then other books are, like, no, this one's fairly recent. Mm-hmm. Um, this one's fairly new. It's uh. It was made into a movie starring Matt Damon and Jude Law and Gwyneth Paltrow. That came out in 1999, is what Google tells me. Okay. The movie. Um, I remember the movie being pretty good, but I had watched it after I read the book. And I'm always a big, like, movie over book guy. Mm-hmm. Even Or no, other way around. I always like the book better than the movie. The um, book came out in 1955. Okay. Oh, it, oh, geez, I should just read the back cover. The very first line is, since his debut in 1955. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the first Whoops. line. Uh, anyway, it's a part of a series. Uh, according to the back of the book, there were five novels written about Ripley, uh, mm-hmm. Tom Ripley. Um, this is the first one. Uh, and it is enjoyable. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Uh, I'll get into the book here. It um. It starts with a character named Tom Ripley. Uh, he lives in New York City. He is uh, he is hanging out in a bar in the middle of the afternoon. Um, he's like a young man, like I think like early 20s. Mm-hmm. Um, he sees somebody watching him in the bar. And then uh, this is done in third person perspective, but it's like an omniscient narrator. So you know what people are thinking. Right. Or wait. I think it's like the semi omniscient or whatever. Like you know what Tom is thinking, but you don't know what other characters are thinking. Right. Uh but it's not from his perspective, it's a third person. Anyway, he's sitting in the bar, he sees someone watching him and he starts to get nervous. In his head he's creating all these situations of like, who is this guy? What is he after? Um I think like he hints at the fact that it could be uh like a private investigator coming to like look for him, or maybe the police have finally found him. Um, Tom is a bit of a, like, con man, I guess. Like, okay. it gets into it a little bit more what he does, but he's very nervous right from the start. Um, he decides to leave this bar, goes to another bar across the street and notices that the man follows him. He starts to wonder if maybe this guy's like a uh, pervert who wants something from him. Mm -hmm. Um, Tom's sexuality comes up a lot in this book, so it kind of establishes right off the bat that he's like thinking of this guy in like sexual terms, this guy following him. Right. Um, but then the guy comes up and introduces himself. He says, I'm Mr. Greenleaf. You're friends with my son, Dickie, right? Or my son, Richard. Sorry. The dad calls him Richard. Tom calls him Dickie. Um, it's not ever super clear whether Tom and Richard were actually friends. Apparently Tom went to a party with Richard one time at Richard's house Mm -hmm. and the dad was there. Right. Uh, the nature of their relationship is never made clear. And then later it's like even called into question. Uh, but anyway, so Tom like kind of fakes his way through the conversation. Uh, the dad says, look, I have a, I want you to come by my place sometime. Um, I need your help involving Richard. 
And then Tom agrees because Tom is kind of like, he'll say anything just to make people happy sort of thing. Right. Uh, Tom gets home and then he finds several letters of people that he's been <laughs> trying to scam. It's like, he's running like this income tax fraud thing where he'll call people or send them. No, he sends them like a typed up letter being like, uh, notice of error in computation. Uh, you pay this amount in income tax with this much deductions. Uh, you still owe an additional $200 or something like that. And then he's like, he gives a fake name along with a PO box where he can pick where they can send the mail. Uh, the PO box is, actually the mailbox of a former place he used to be living at mm -hmm. that he can still collect the mail from. Um, Tom doesn't ever like own his own apartment at the beginning. He's always like staying with friends and like sponging off them and then leaving when things get rough. Mm -hmm. uh, so he's, this is his big scam that he's trying to put through. Uh, it says that he's gotten a few checks from people, but they always make it out to the like tax service. Yeah. And never to the fake name that he gives. So he can't actually cash them. <laughs> so he's running the scam with no benefit. Right. Uh, so this is what he's doing. It's like right from the start, Tom is painted as like, um, like a very like empty person. Like he's just immediately fake in all situations. Mm -hmm. He's very like, um, like he'll say whatever to get by. He's very manipulative, but he's also very like, tense and nervous all the time he doesn't like being around people he hates like the people who think that they're his friends kind of thing um i think it's because tom is very he lies about everything mm -hmm. so people who've known him for any length of time it's like how does he keep the lies straight right but that might be me reading into it a bit um anyway he goes to the Greenleafs. they say that their son richard has uh he moved to italy on a vacation he's not coming home it's he's been there for like a year uh, they really want him to come home and take over the family business. Uh, they're, like, super rich. They run, like, some industrial thing in New York. Um, the mother is also sick, and they really want Richard to come home before the mother dies. Uh, Tom is like, well, I don't really know him that well. And they're like, please, you got to go talk to him. We'll pay for your trip. And then he's like, you know, I could use a trip to Italy. <laughs> so mm -hmm. he kind of, like, starts to ham up how well him and Richard actually knew each other. I was like, yeah, you know, we went way back. Like, I could probably talk to him out of, talk to him into coming home. Um, and then he thinks that they're like, he thinks he's like thoroughly charming these people. And he's like bragging about how great it is. And like, he's like, oh, I've got them. They love me more than their own son kind of thing. Mm -hmm. They give him a bunch of money and a ticket. Um, he talks to a few of his friends in New York before he leaves. He tries to scam one more time, still doesn't get anything. He takes the money that the parents gave him and he buys some stuff for traveling and puts it under their account, mm -hmm. which he's been told he's allowed to do. Um, he, I don't know if he knows this yet. Um, at some point he, or he buys some clothes for the son that he's supposed to bring to him, like buy some clothes for Richard. Uh, and I think at this point the, like the mom tells him that they're roughly the same size. So just buy something that would fit you and it should fit our son. Right. Um, that comes up. That's very prominent later in the book. All right. Uh, Tom heads to Italy. He hates the boat because he's afraid of water. Um, it's also something that comes up later. He, oh, his some of his friends from New York come to see him off, and he's so mad at this because in his head he's invented this like new persona and this like adventure. And his old friends come and they're like drunk and they're like hanging out in his room. And one of the girls is like, Tom, Tommy, I can just hide under this cabinet. Nobody will know. I could come with you. And he is so furious. He has to leave the room because mm -hmm. he just like, he wants to be the cool, suave European Tom. He doesn't want to be uh, New York scumbag Tom anymore. Um, eventually the boat leaves. The people are gone. He makes it to Italy. He goes to the little vi village called uh, Mangibello, I mm -hmm. believe. And he's looking around. Um, he finds. Richard Greenleaf and his sort of girlfriend, Marge, who's very important in this book. Um, he finds them at the beach, I believe. Uh, he goes up to Richard and Tom goes up to Richard and starts a conversation. Uh, it's clear that Richard doesn't remember Tom. And that's why I think that Tom has exaggerated their relationship throughout the whole beginning of the book. Right. It's because Richard has no idea who he is and doesn't seem like he wants to see him. Um, apparently the dad wrote a letter saying that Tom was coming to visit 
on their behalf. And so, like, it's automatically put, like, made Richard not like this guy. Um, but anyway, so Tom, like, he has, like, a really bad first meeting with them. He's trying to, like, ingratiate himself with Richard, and Richard just is having none of it. Mm-hmm. Um, Richard is described as being, like, very slim, very handsome, very, um, like, he's tall, he's got blonde hair. Uh, he uses a lot of very flattering terms to describe Richard. Okay. And then he uses very insulting terms to describe Marge. Like, she's, like, uh, gourd-shaped, I think he calls her at one point. Um, he's, she's sleepy and stupid. So, do you think that's... Is that his sexuality playing into that? Yeah, it's yeah. definitely foreshadowing some stuff that comes up. Okay. Uh, Tom, anyway, so, so that's kind of how it starts... Um, it's very, the book is never explicitly clear on Tom's sexuality, right, right. but it comes up so many times. It's, it seems like it's implied. Yeah. Okay. And it's, it's more implied later. Okay. Okay. He, so he's like really bummed out and plus two, he's sick from the food. He's like tired from all the travel. He goes back to his motel and basically collapses. Um, but he had told uh, Richard that he has some items for him. He has this clothing from like gifts from his mother. So he has to see him at least one more time. Right. Um, when Tom goes to see Richard again, I think it's a couple days later. Uh, it's still clear that Richard and Marge don't want him around, but then he like, okay, I'm just going to kind of like, this is like my attempt at being his friend. He's like, he got the feeling that Richard doesn't like his dad. So then he's like, you know, your dad paid for me to come up here and, uh, your dad's giving me a bunch of money, so while I've got your dad's money, I might as well take us out for dinner. And, like, Richard thought this was, like, funny or, like, hilarious or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's, like, sticking it to the old man. So they go out for dinner. Um, Ha-ha, I guess we're going to have to go out to dinner together and spend your dad's money, you know? Yeah. Dinner, you and I, yeah. You and me. Yeah. Uh, and then he gets mad when Marge comes along. <laughs> uh, of course he does. <laughs> so that's the start of Tom and Richard's new friendship. Yeah. Uh, they start hanging out a lot. Eventually, actually, it's, like, the first night... Um, Richard suggests, like, if you, instead of paying for a hotel, why don't you just stay with me? I've got an extra room. Um, so then that happens. And then Tom and Richard go on a lot of, like, vacations together. Uh, they're, like, they're in Italy, right? So they're just traveling to, like, the nearby town or they're going to Rome or whatever. Right. And, uh, Tom is, like, loving this. And he starts to, like, connive ways to, like, exclude Marge from all their plans. Right. Um, and... This backfires on him so badly because he's got this, he's like, they're planning this trip together for Christmas time. Mm -hmm. Like Tom starts to think, you know, maybe I could just live here and like me and Richard can be bros. Like he's very, he never insinuates that they will be more than just best friends, but uh, it's kind of clear there's something going on with Tom. Uh, Anyway, so then he keeps trying to like trick ways to like leave Marge out and stuff. There's supposed to be this big trip at Christmas to Greece that. Richard invites Tom along too, and then Tom's like trying to plan ways to get Marge uninvited to this trip, so it's just the two of them. And then Marge is like starts to become standoffish and stuff, Mm -hmm. and Richard feels really bad because okay, so Tom's take on the two is that Marge is in love with Richard, but Richard is indifferent. Right. And it kind of seems that way, but also it's not very clear what their relationship is. Um Richard says that Marge was very, like, was a very good friend to him. And during the winter months when all the tourists had left, they were the only two Americans left in Italy in that area. Mm -hmm. And that she was, like, a very close friend to him during this time. So he feels bad, like, ditching her. So then he wants to make it up to her. So he goes to her apartment. Like, so Richard goes to Marge's apartment one afternoon. Right. Tom follows and then sees them, like, kissing through the window. And he gets so mad. He, like, slams the gate of her house shut and runs away. Mm-hmm. And it's not clear that if she saw him. But anyway, so he goes back to Richard's house and he starts trying on Richard's clothes. Okay. In front of the mirror. Because he, like, really admires Richard to the point of, like, he wants to be Richard. Right. Which is going to come up later in this okay. book. Okay, yeah. Uh, so Tom's in front of the mirror wearing these clothes and then Richard comes home. And Richard's like, I wish you wouldn't wear my clothes. And then, so then... Tom starts stripping, like, in the room. And then Richard says something like, Look, I don't care. I don't care about you, but I'm not a queer. I don't want you 
thinking that we're in any kind of relationship or something. That's like hit the exact words is I'm not a queer. I remember that. Right. Um, and then apparently, so Marge has been noticing how Tom is acting around Richard and she said something. Mm -hmm. So then Tom, like Tom denies it. And, uh, he's like, I don't know why she would ever think that. (laughs) And just, uh, yeah, his, this is part of Tom's sexuality popping up in this book. Right. Um, so him and Richard have this weird sort of argument. Then after that, I think this happens in like October. It's like as the summer's ending. So it's like in the fall or autumn. And uh, Richard's starting implying that Tom should be thinking about going back to America, that he's been sponging off his dad for long enough kind of thing. Um, he also gets a letter from Mr. Greenleaf being like, well, you tried your best, but uh, looks like mission's a failure. <laughs> like, Right. Have fun for the rest of your vacation or whatever you want to do, but basically, like, no more money. Right. Um, Tom is, like, infuriated by this. He can't stand that Richard is not as good friends with him anymore. Um, Richard's spending a lot more time alone with Marge and, like, leaving Tom by himself. Mm-hmm. He's uh, basically the Christmas trip that Tom was trying to get Marge uninvited to. Now Tom's been sort of uninvited <laughs> to this trip. Right, right. Um, and it's driving Tom nuts. He can't stand it. So then they go on a trip together. Tom wants to go to Paris, but Richard doesn't want to because you need your passport to travel across the border. And for whatever reason, that's like too big of an inconvenience for him. Mm -hmm. Um, Tom is like really mad because he thinks that before him and Richard were doing all this fun stuff and they would like stay out all night drinking and stuff like that. But now after him and Marge had this talk, he's like lazy and wants to lay around the house all time or hang out with Marge and doesn't want to go out and do fun stuff. Um, so then they go on this one little trip together, him and Tom and, uh, Richard. Marge has asked Richard to look for a certain perfume for her. And Tom is so mad. Like, even when she's not coming, she's still interfering with her plans. Right. Um, there, they go to the small coastal town that have like a bunch of like international shops on it to find this perfume. And then Tom sees that they have motorboats that you can take for rides. And Richard is, uh experienced sailor he likes going out on the water so tom suggests it and richard's well first first there's another part sorry where there's some acrobats in the water and they're doing like it's like men in like the thong swimsuits right. yeah, yeah. this is specified in the book right, right. Um, and they're doing like the human pyramid and stuff like that and like they're doing like it sounds like they're doing like synchronized swimming but then it also sounds like they're doing more like acrobatic stuff right so i don't know 100 percent, but yeah so they're there and then Tom is like watching them. And then he said, Oh, look, Richard, this is amazing. And then Richard quotes some line of poetry, like implying that these guys are all fairies. And like, you know, I'm thinking meaning the anti gay, like slur. Mm-hmm. And Tom is like very offended by this and he's really mad. And then so he refuses to look at the acrobats again. Uh, Richard's like, You know what? I'm going to go read my book. Like, you go, you stare at those acrobats however long you want and leaves. And then Tom follows him and then Richard is like annoyed that Tom is still there. So then anyway, so then they get to the boat, uh, they go out on the water for a bit and then Tom grabs an oar and smashes Richard on the head. Oh, and then smashes him again and again and again. And then Richard's still alive. So he starts smashing him on the neck with it. And, uh, Richard, Dickie Greenleaf is now dead. Right. Um, somehow through the process oh and then there's a like anchor sort of like cement block in the boat like tied to a rope so then tom is trying to like break th- or like rip the rope and tie it around uh dickie's ankles and throw him out to sea basically so the body will be lost right um he has trouble with this at some point he tips the boat over i think it's as he pushes dickie overboard with the anchor the entire boat tips over mm-hmm. and uh, Tom, who's like terrified of the water, is like struggling, doesn't know what to do. Um, he, the boat's like ripping around on its motor, and Tom's like in the water, and he's trying to get to the boat, and he like is struggling. He's like, he almost kills himself in the process, right, basically. Right, right. Eventually, he gets the boat under control. He fills it full of rocks and then sinks the boat in the bay, uh, slightly further away from where he sunk the body. Because um, one of the things gets found later, spoiler. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tom then, so he had Dick. Uh, Dick Greenleaf had two rings on that he wore all the time. Mm-hmm. There's like this green, like emerald thing, and then he had like a signet ring. And 
The green emerald he'd take off when he was swimming, but the signet he never took off. Um, so, but Tom stole both these rings. He stole his... I, uh, yeah, he stole Richard's ID and, like, his overnight bag and, like, a bunch of his clothes and stuff. Um, Tom puts on Richard's clothes because Tom's clothes are covered in blood. Right. And then as he's walking back, like, a lot of people are mistaking him for green, like, Dick Greenleaf. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, these ideas start to form in his head. Um, Tom decides he's going to go to Montebello and he's going to get the rest of his stuff out of Dick's house, but he's also going to take a bunch of Dick's stuff with him. And then he tells, he runs into Marge while there and he's like, gives her the perfume. And then he says, Oh, by the way, um, Dick decided he's moving to Rome. And she's like, what? And he's like, yeah, he's moving there to study under some artist. Cause he wanted to be a painter. Uh, and that's that's actually like what Dick had been doing in Italy the entire time was painting. Right. But so but this whole story is invented, right? So then Tom's going on about oh he's met this painter he's going to be studying underneath him he's moving to Rome uh, I'm I've decided I'm going to bring his stuff to him in Rome and then I'm probably moving on to visit the rest of Italy. Um, Marge is super suspicious, doesn't trust him at all, and it's kind of like why wouldn't Dick tell me himself? And he's like oh he just. You know, he just wanted to be alone for a while. You know how he is. And she's like, uh, okay. <laughs> um, so he steals a bunch of the stuff. He goes to Rome. And then he told her a hotel he'd be staying at. But then when he got to that hotel, he immediately decided to switch place, like, to another hotel. Mm-hmm. So that she couldn't find him as easily. Um, and then Dick had also been receiving monthly income from his family's company, I believe. Or from a trust fund or something. Right. And all he had to do was sign his name on the check and cash it. So then Tom starts forging the signatures and signing the checks and stealing Dick's money. Uh, He also starts wearing all of Dick's clothes. He starts wearing the rings. He dyes his hair blonde so that he looks more like him. Mm -hmm. Um, They're the same height. They're the same, like, rough build. I think Tom was a little bit skinnier than Dick, so he starts, like, putting on weight. Uh, Just all so he can pass as Richard Greenleaf. Um he let's see while he's there it goes really good at first and he's like just like he's kind of annoyed because marge and some of their friends from Bello like are trying to plan a trip to rome to visit dick and tom's like trying to convince them not to because you know he's they'll know the difference basically as soon as they see him right right uh, but all these people who only like sort of knew dick greenleaf are fooled but like the actual close friends won't be fooled mm-hmm. uh and then so it's going kind of okay i think There's a lot of parts in this book where he's just, like, touring Italy and, like, having fun and looking at the scenery and stuff. Uh, And meanwhile, freaking out because, of what if they find the boat or what if they find the body? Um, A lot of this book happens in Tom's head where he's, like, so, like, concerned that something's going to happen or he's going to be found out or that the check scamming thing is going to come back to haunt him or something. Um, But then, like, he often gets very lucky in this book and none of what he imagines happens. Uh, Mm -hmm. So he's touring, he's back in Rome after a trip around Italy, and then a guy named Freddie Miles comes to visit. Freddie is introduced a little earlier when Dick is still alive, and Freddie is like this, like, fat, obnoxious American, I believe he's American, uh, but he's like another fat, obnoxious tourist. Uh, Tom can't stand him, but, like, him and Richard, like, but uh, Richard and, uh, whatever his name is, what did I say his name was? Do you remember? Um, I like just suddenly blanked on it. <laughs> it's something Miles. Um, uh, I was actually just looking at it. Um, uh, Tom, it's Tom Ripley. Oh man, why? Did... Freddie, sorry, Freddie. Yeah, Freddie Miles. Um, Freddie was the one who was planning this Christmas trip that Tom and uh, Marge and Richard were supposed to go on. Um, But then after nobody went on this trip because one of them was dead, Mm -hmm. one of them was pretending to be the one who was dead, and Marge had like felt like she was totally like abandoned. Um, So none of them went on this Christmas trip. Freddie was upset, and he came to Rome to find uh, Richard Greenleaf, and he was given directions. He like coaxed us someone. He goes to the apartment that Tom had been renting under Richard's name, Mm -hmm. and. He comes upstairs and, like, I don't think he opens the door, but I think he bangs on the door 
like of the apartment right and tom lets him in not knowing who like who it is right and uh so then this guy whose name i already forgot again freddy F- freddy yeah <laughs> <laughs> he uh he comes in and he's like mad to see tom there and he's like where's where's dicky like i was told he was here um and like tom's trying to like send him to like a he's like oh we went out for lunch at this place uh he usually doesn't get back to like three o'clock so why don't you go find him there and blah blah blah. like he's just trying to get rid of him yeah and then like they have like this weird argument it's pretty clear that freddy is like very suspicious uh and i think also too this might be another instance of like the sexuality popping up Mm -hmm. because freddy's like more suspicious that these two men were sharing a room together than that like something might have happened to dicky right so then he's like kind of asking all these questions uh a lot of dicky's friends like instinctively don't trust tom which i mean given fair. what's happened is fair <laughs> uh, so freddie goes to leave and then he stops he sees the landlady downstairs and then he asks her i thought you said dicky was home and then she's like yeah he's home upstairs and then he's like did he have any visitors today and then she said no he's by himself upstairs so then freddie goes back up to confront tom and tom grabs a large ashtray and smashes it against freddie's head until freddie dies great yeah so now we've got two murders in two this murders book. Um, Tom doesn't know what to do because this time, like he kind of planned ahead with uh, with Rich, like with uh, Dicky, mm-hmm. but he did not plan ahead at all with Freddie. He just reacted. Yeah. So then he doesn't know what to do. He ends up like basically trying to force liquor down the throat of the corpse, and then also drink a bunch himself to like have an alibi. Mm-hmm. And then he waits until like dusk, and then he slings the body over his shoulder like it's a drunk and like carries him down to his car because uh, freddie had a car there right he takes freddie's car and then he drives to like a cemetery or something on the opposite side of town he hides the corpse behind a tombstone um, he cleans up his fingerprints he abandons the car somewhere not too far away from the cemetery but like a little distance away yeah uh, and then he goes back to his room he thinks he's fine there's only one person that saw him taking the body out and they bought the story that they were drunk and tom was also sufficiently drunk so that his breath would smell like alcohol right um he gets walks back home uh he thinks he's all fine in the clear the next morning he checks the newspapers there's no mention of this murder um but the police are on his doorstep like shortly after uh and then this starts the like I'd say, like, the last third of this book is all the police are coming to see Tom. Tom is making up lies, making up stories. Uh, their big interview about Freddy, he denies knowing anything. Um, they said he's not allowed to leave Rome until the questions are done. He decides to move to a hotel instead so that people wouldn't, because the newspapers printed the address in which the person was last seen, and he didn't want people showing up the address looking for Dickie Greenleaf. So then he goes to a hotel, uh, Marge shows up, and then he's uh, Tom says, like, oh, you know, you just missed uh, Dickie. He was just here, blah, blah, blah. And then she's, like, kind of disturbed by this because uh, Tom had been writing her letters as Richard Greenleaf the whole time. Right. And she had been, like, outright bashing Tom and being like, get away from this guy. He's a bad influence on you. <laughs> like, <laughs> basically, he's not a good guy. Right. And then he was like responding as Richard being like, Oh, don't worry. Tom went up to the North of Italy. He's been gone this whole time. And then she gets to his hotel room as Tom is there. Right. And, uh, no Richard. So he kind of like, he kind of is able to like shift her attention away. Uh, then he, then the cops come again. And this time to ask who they think is Dickie Greenleaf about the missing location of a Tom Ripley. Because, uh, Tom hasn't been seen since Dickie died because Tom's been posing as Dickie this entire time. Right, right. And they found out that one of the boats was not returned on the day they rented the boat. And they found the boat sunk at the bottom of the sea with bloodstains in it. And so they think there's been a murder and they think that Dickie Greenleaf murdered Tom Ripley. Right. And Tom is like, oh, no, I saw him. I saw Tom Ripley not that long ago, blah, blah, blah. Um, and the police don't really believe him. Uh, then he, what does he do? But they don't have any like evidence to hold him. So he asks if he can, like, he was planning on traveling. So he's like, can I go up to such and such a place? And basically it's okay as long as he stayed in the country. So then he went to Naples, um, 
he's hanging out there for a bit. He decides he's going to get rid of... Oh, no, he goes to Naples or Venice. I think he might go to Venice first. Uh, he goes... To, nope, he goes to Naples first as Dickie. He's seen there. He presents uh, his passport there. And then, like, more secretively, he goes to Venice. And there he decides to drop off all of Dickie Greenleaf's, like, belongings at a American Express location or something. Um, it sounds like a, some kind of, like, embassy or something for American tourists. Right. He drops all the stuff off there under a fake name. It's like Richard, or it's like something, uh, Greenspan or something like that. Uh, then he goes back home. He dyes his hair dark again. Um, he puts, starts wearing glasses because he thinks that uh, Tom Ripley would wear glasses where Dickie Greenleaf didn't wear glasses. Uh, even though, you know, he's Tom Ripley and he never wore glasses before, right, but right. he decides that would differentiate them more. Like he's, a uh, Clark Kent thing. Yeah, yeah, he's basically wearing a disguise as himself. Right. And like, but it, it talks about in this book how like a big part of tricking people is not so much how you look, but how you act. Mm -hmm. And like, if you can master someone's mannerisms and if you can master the way they talk and the way they walk, that it's almost better than having a perfect disguise. Mm -hmm. And so he's just like, he was acting very confidently as Richard Greenleaf and walking very tall and acting like aloof and stuff. And now he was going to pretend to be more like, like nerdy and shy as Tom Ripley. And that's his whole plan. He's yeah. He's Clark Kenting it. Uh, he has the cops after him a couple times. Um, he ends up moving to Venice or no, he comes, he bought a car as Tom. He drove around for a bit. He slept in the car for a bit. And then once the newspapers reported on Tom Ripley being missing, then he presented himself at the police station and said, I'm Tom Ripley. I'm not missing. Um, but now, of course, now Dickie Greenleaf is missing. Right. Uh, so they believe that Richard's gone missing uh, in connection with this other murder. Um, also, those checks that Tom's been cashing under Richard's name, mm -hmm. well, all the forgeries or all those signatures came back as forgeries. So now they're investigating that. Um, there's a lot of scenes of like, tom like not knowing what to do or like imagining the worst situation uh or and then there's other scenes of him being very confident and then like suddenly having it all shattered by like a new newspaper headline or something right right uh marge comes up to visit him and they're like kind of speculating he's the story he started now is that when he went to visit dickie in the hotel like when marge saw tom in the hotel mm -hmm. that dickie had admitted that this whole pressure over freddie's death was too much for him and the police were interrogating him and um that had like really gotten to him and that he was like considering suicide and nobody believes this at first but that's the story that tom is like kind of peddling right he sends a letter to richard's father and says the same thing richard's father ends up coming to italy um they're having some talks there's a lot of like tom not knowing whether these people suspect him or not um i think a lot of it too is just they don't really like tom because he's like a very like shallow and fake person mm -hmm. but he doesn't quite understand that and he takes it all as suspicion um because throughout the book none of the main characters suspect tom right they all think he's just like the friend right uh even the police like the italian police especially don't really seem to suspect tom they never figure out what happened to dickie greenleaf um they think first they thought that dickie like ran away that he committed this murder and now he's hiding out mm -hmm. and some people think that he never committed the murder, but he's like trying to get away from his parents and the obligations they've set on him. Um, and then Tom's peddling the theory that he killed himself. Then when Marge comes to Venice to visit Tom and they're just coming to talk about like this whole thing about, you know, Dickie going missing and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And Tom like kind of reluctantly invites her to, invites her to stay at his house because he's got a large house that he's renting and she does and then at one point they're like going to parties and stuff and tom like hates it because he hates all this attention right but marge like is feeling pretty distraught over her like ex or whatever going missing mm -hmm. uh, and then at one point she like rips her dress or rips her bra or something and then when she gets home she goes into a sewing case to try to find some thread to fix it and instead she finds two rings that tom hid uh, a green ring that Dickie wore every day and then Dickie's signature signet ring or whatever. Right, right. Uh, so then she finds those and Tom is like, this is it. 
and then but then when she comes down and it's like like it's a very tense moment and then she's like i guess you're right he really did kill himself if he left you his rings oh. and tom's like oh yeah uh, <laughs> which, he's like can't believe that she like that that's the conclusion she came to yeah and then so she's like we better tell tom's dad and it's like yeah that's a good idea they tell tom's dad um and then uh tom's dad brought in a private detective from america and like this guy seems to like actually be on the ball right and tom's like okay this is like this is gonna be it but then the guy's like interviewing tom and tom's giving him a big long list of names of people he can talk to and then the detective's like well you know if he found his rings and stuff he probably killed himself (laughs) so tom thinks he's in the clear um then he gets greedy of course he does he faked a letter from dicky saying like uh you know if if i'm not back by june then or don't open this letter until june or something like that right and then when june rolls around he open he sends this letter to uh greenleaf's parents and it's basically saying i want uh this is richard greenleaf and i want tom to bequeath all my like it's a will giving tom ripley everything that dicky owned right right and <laughs> so tom's getting greedy he sends this letter And immediately after sending it, they find the um, suitcases that had been left at the American Embassy or the American Express or whatever. Mm -hmm. And Tom's like, oh, great. They found his stuff. They're going to find my fingerprints on it. And they're going to get this letter of me trying to steal all his money. Like, this is it. But he had planned a trip for Greece around this time. Mm -hmm. And he was like, I'm just going on this trip. He leaves. When he gets to Greece... There's like a bunch of police waiting at the dock and he's like, this is it. It's over. Um, then he gets off the boat. Police don't say anything to him. So he keeps walking. But apparently they were looking for somebody else. Oh, <laughs> all right. He picks up a newspaper and it said that the fingerprints had been found on this luggage matched the fingerprint fingerprints from Dickie's apartment in Rome, AKA the place that Tom was staying where he was pretending to be Dickie. Right. Uh, and then he got a letter from the parents like, you know what? It actually doesn't surprise us too much. We know you and Richard were very close. Our huh. lawyers are going to sort through this for you. All right. And then the book kind of ends with uh, oh. this multi-murderer totally this getting away with it. serial killer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of the thing. Like, the thing that's good about this book is the character of Tom Ripley. Right. Uh, he's very, like... I, like, he's a... He's a huge manipulator. He's like, what's the one if you have no empathy? Is that sociopath? sociopath? He is a 100% sociopath. He's a bit of a narcissist too because he's very like, he thinks he's better than everyone and he mm-hmm. thinks he's getting away with it at all times because mm-hmm. everyone else is stupid. Mm-hmm. Um, and like, so he's, he's very interesting in the way he behaves. He's the type of character that you don't want to see him succeed, but he's also like, personable enough that you're not like mad that he got away with it right you're kind of like oh i can't believe it um right i'd say it's like do you remember that show dexter did you ever watch that show? i watched like one season of dexter okay um well i thought the first couple seasons of dexter were very good mm-hmm. and tom kind of has that energy about him mm-hmm. where it's like yeah he's an evil person yeah he's killing other people but at the same time you don't you don't feel bad at the end when he gets away with it because it's like you kind of feel like I don't know. Um, (laughs) Tom. Yeah. So, and then Tom, like, he's very interesting with the way, like, his sexuality is. Because I think at one point, Richard describes in a letter. No. One of the letters that Marge sent to fake Richard, who is Tom. Yeah. Says, uh, oh, I think you're right that Tom isn't really queer. I think he's too weird to be sleeping with anyone. (laughs) And I feel like that more accurately describes Tom's sexuality. Right. In that he's like too, he's too like fake of a person and he doesn't like understand other people very well. He's got no empathy and like he might admire Richard Greenleaf, but it's more like, I don't know if he wanted to have sex with Richard Greenleaf. I think it was more that he wanted to be Richard Greenleaf. Right. And that that's what he ended up doing. Right. Um, I mean, though, I think it's really open for debate and really like open to interpretation. Um. Uh, Let's see. It's also, this book is very tense. Like, there's a lot of scenes where it's like, oh, they're going to catch him now. Or, oh, like, there's no way he's getting away with this. Yeah. And then when he does get away and with then it, he does, like, yeah. Huh. Well, would you look at that? <laughs> Surprise. Um, 
yeah i uh this book's pretty easy it's like a 270 page read mm-hmm. um i did it like uh so at my work i used to be able to read books during like when my clients were busy with other things mm-hmm. but that hasn't been an option over the past couple months yeah um but still this book like really it was like two evenings and then this morning i read for a couple hours um so like it's not like a hard read yeah uh the only thing is because it's so tense there are parts where it feels like you need to take a break yeah um so like i i don't know i enjoyed it uh, i remember enjoying the movie so if you think the book sounded cool but you don't want to invest time in reading you can always check out the movie i saw the movie had jude law in it it does jude law is uh dicky okay and matt damon is tom oh interesting yeah interesting okay and uh i think gwyneth paltrow was marge yeah it's it had i saw gwyneth paltrow and jude law i didn't see the uh, matt damon but that's cool that's cool yeah um yeah it's uh, i don't know so uh we're past <laughs> our time uh i would recommend it um danny where can people find us people can find us on facebook literary af you can find us on twitter literary af pod you can send us an email at literary af pod at gmail.com and you can listen to us on iTunes, Spotify, Podbean, YouTube, and I believe we're on Audible podcast. Oh, I didn't even that option. I didn't know they did podcast, but the the option for it popped up when I was uploading our Podbean stuff. Ooh. So I hit yes. So we're probably there. I'm not sure. Interesting. All right. Well, if you find us there, then <laughs> cool. Yeah. If you're listening <laughs> to us from that website, then uh, hello. <laughs> uh, all right. Well. Next week, are we doing the next part of... T- um, yeah, if I, I... I'm gonna try. Midnight I'm, Sun, right? That's yeah, what's Midnight Sun. The... I'm just under 200 pages into the book. Okay. Now. Um, I start work tomorrow, so we'll see what kind of energy I have to read books. This yeah, week, it's but... true. I feel like this whole year has been just off. And, yeah. Um, so if we're not uploading on time, just blame it on 2020. It, everything, yeah. Yet another... Victim of 2020 yeah. literary AF podcast. <laughs> Possibly the worst. Or the, <laughs> the biggest. The most egregious loss. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, anyway, thanks for listening. Yeah. And uh, tune in next time <laughs> when we talk about a book again. More, more books. Books. <laughs>